like to introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Nelson Minich, who comes to us from the Catholic University of America. Uh, Professor Minich is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and uh, Nelson Herbert M Hubert Minich has taught Renaissance Reformation and Counter-Reformation History at the Catholic University of America since 1977 holding a joint position as full professor in the Church History Program of the School of Theology and Religious Studies and also in the History Department uh, at the University there. He has been editor of the Catholic Historical Review since 2005 and served for over a quarter century as advisory and associate editor of that journal. He holds degrees in philosophy, his BA from Boston College. Uh, in theology, he has a baccalaureate in sacred theology from the Gregorian University in Rome, and also in history, uh, an MA from Boston College, and then his PhD from Harvard University in 1977. His dissertation was on the topic of Episcopal Reform at the Fifth Lateran Council, 1512 to 1517, directed by Myron Gilmore. <clears throat> Professor Minich is a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Vila the American Academy in Rome, the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Philosophical Society, the Renaissance Society of America, and the National Humanities Center. And since 2007, he has been a member of the Pontifico, Pontificio Comitato di Scienze Storici, in other words, the Italian uh, branch of history, and was reappointed in 2012. He has published a number of books, among which uh, included a festrift honoring John Tracy Ellis, four collections of studies that deal mostly with conciliar history from Pisa to the First Council of Pisa to Trent, uh, and a volume on Erasmus controversies with Alberto Chio. He served as the associate editor for uh, the 80 church history entries in the six volume Encyclopedia of the Renaissance is author of 23 book chapters, 28 articles in scholarly journals, over 30 entries in encyclopedias and reference works, and numerous book reviews. And alongside of all that scholarly productivity, he also is active in his local parish at St. Jerome's in Hyattsville, Maryland, and is an avid contra and waltz dancer. So uh, you'll have some things to talk to him about in, in, after the lecture. Uh, that are more cultural, I suppose you would say, than historical. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Minich. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Probably the best thing to do, since we're going to talk about German princes, is to put them in some kind of geographical context. So I started off with this map. Uh, you probably think of Germany today as a unified country. Back in the 16th century, it was not unified at all. Uh, it was a conglomeration of something like 319 in semi-independent units, uh, and trying to run this thing was very difficult. If you were the emperor, good luck. Uh, and among these 319 entities, there were seven which were more powerful than the others. They were the ones who elected the emperor. Uh, of the seven, three were, now this is a strange concept for you, uh, they were prince bishops, okay? This is a bishop who is a prince, and that means he has castles, he has armies, he has people who pay taxes, he has territory, uh, he's a significant figure on the scene. If you look at this map up here, you see this uh, stuff like in purple, gray, those are all prince bishops, okay? So you can see Germany's full of these guys. Uh, the most important of them are the ones along the Rhine River. Uh, we start off here with Mainz, he, the Archbishop of Mainz. If you go down the river, then you get Trier and Cologne. So those are the three electoral archbishops. Uh, the other electors are down in the Palatinate of Baltz and German. You go up here in Brandenburg, the Margrave of Brandenburg, then you come down to Saxony, the Electoral Saxony, and then you have the King of Bohemia. So these are, this is what we're talking about. So if you're trying to deal with Martin Luther, uh, you have to deal with all these princes uh, and trying to get cooperation among them. Uh, you've probably recently been 
you know, overwhelmed on the news about the dramatic event and uh, Halloween of 1517 with Martin Luther taking the 95 Theses and pounding them on the castle door of Wittenberg. Well, there was another grand, perhaps even more dramatic event, which occurred four years later in the city of Worms. And that's where we're going to begin our talk today. Uh, on April 18, well, I guess we've got it all set up. On April 18, 1521, Martin Luther gave his famous speech before Emperor Charles V. Oh, by the way, I, one thing I should point out on this map is, you know, well, you notice all this yellow stuff all over the place? One man runs that, uh, and that is the Habsburgs. Uh, and so the most powerful of all the princes in Germany was the, was the Habsburg prince. Uh, and he was, uh, well, we'll find out uh, later on, but I just want to give you a sense of this man and the territory he controls. This is Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. So uh, Martin Luther gave a famous speech before Emperor Charles V and the princes of the Holy Roman Empire assembled at a diet in the city of Worms. In response to the demand that he recant his writings that contained propositions denounced in the papal bull Exerge Domine, the 37-year-old Augustinian friar exclaimed, quotes, so long as I cannot be disproved by holy scripture or clear reason, so long I neither can nor will withdraw anything, for it is both criminal and dangerous to act against one's conscience. So help me God, amen. Rather dramatic statement. As courageous as these words were, they were spoken with an imperial safe conduct before an assembly full of his supporters. On the following day, the 21-year-old 21 21-year-old 21 emperor gave his response, quote, you know that I am born of the most Christian emperors. This paper sticking together here. Of the noble German nation, of the Catholic kings of Spain, the Archdukes of Austria, the Dukes of Burgundy, who were all to their death true sons of the Roman Catholic Church, defenders of the faith, of the sacred customs, decrees, and uses of its worship, who will bequeath all this to me as my heritage, and according to whose example I have hitherto lived. Thus, I am determined to hold fast by all which has happened since the Council of Constance, for it is certain that a single friar must be an heir if he stands against the opinion of all Christendom. Otherwise, Christendom itself would have erred for more than a thousand years. Therefore, I am determined to set my kingdoms and dominions, my friends, my body, my blood, my life, my soul upon it, for it would be a great shame to us and to you, you members of the noble German nation, if in our time, through our negligence, we were to let even the appearance of heresy and denigration of true religion enter the hearts of men. You have heard Luther's speech here yesterday, and now I say unto you that I regret that I have delayed so long to proceed against him. I will not hear him again. He has his safe conduct, and from now on, I regard him as a notorious heretic, and I hope that you all, as good Christians will not be wanting in your duty. Thus spoke the 21-year-old emperor. When no action by the Diet was taken to condemn Luther, many of his supporters left before the formal closure of the assembly. Once the emperor could count on enough votes, he had the remaining princes approve an edict which made Luther an outlaw of the empire. Luther's supporters felt that they had been tricked and that the edict had no validity. The chancellor of the empire, the Cardinal Archbishop of Mainz, Albrecht of Brandenburg, did not sign the edict. And the elector of Saxony, Frederick de Wise, arranged with Emperor Charles that the edict not be sent to him for implementation. Frederick 
had Luther kidnapped on his return to Saxony and taken to his castle of Wartburg for safekeeping. Many were the reasons Luther found support among the German princes at this early stage of the Reformation. When threatened with excommunication by the bull Exerge Domine of June 15, 1520, Luther penned his famous three treatises defending his views. The first of these treatises was his appeal to the ruling class of the German nation for the amelioration of the state of Christendom, published on 20 June 1520. Among his 27 proposals for improving the state of Christendom were the elimination of numerous papal practices that were the common complaint of Christian rulers from the time of the Council of Constance, namely papal reservations, expectancies and coadjutorships, commendendums, pensions, unions of benefices, annates, pallium and service fees to the bloated curial bureaucracy, mandated oaths of loyalty to the Pope imposed on new prelates, transferring legal cases from local Episcopal and Metropolitan courts to those in Rome, reserving cases to Roman adjudication, papal claims to jurisdiction over civil authorities, and rights to intervene in imperial affairs based on the fraudulent donation of Constantine, insistence that emperors and rulers kiss his foot, arrogance in papal ceremonies to the denigration of the Eucharist, and on and on. The Concordats of Constance of 1418 and of Vienna of 1448 tried to limit these curial practices in Germany, but with only limited success, allowing many of these perceived abuses to continue if a benefice fell vacant in an odd-numbered month called papal months. Most of these complaints listed by Luther can be found in the 102 grievances against the Roman Curia submitted by the German Diet in Worms before hearing the case of Luther. Luther was thus seen as a spokesman for the German nation. He was given a hero's welcome in Worms. The 16-year-old Landgrave of Hesse, Philip, personally visited Luther in his inn and spoke with him. Philip became an ardent supporter of his cause. Luther's overlord, the Elector of Saxony, had conferred in Cologne on November 5, 1520, with the leading humanist and religious writer of the period, the Augustinian canon Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, requesting his assessment of Luther, a man the elector had never met, although they lived in the same town of Wittenberg. Erasmus threw his support behind Luther, claiming, quotes, Luther has sinned in two things, by attacking the Pope's crown and the monk's bellies. Later that evening, Erasmus penned his axiomata, in which he spelled out in detail his understanding of the controversy. According to Erasmus, it sprang from a hatred of the humanities. The papal bull condemning Luther was probably a forgery since it did not reflect the characteristic gentleness of Leo X. Those who were most expert in sacred scripture find little to criticize in Luther's writings. His willingness to debate his positions before unbiased judges seems very reasonable. The friar has no personal ambitions in this matter. The best way to proceed would be to submit the dispute to a committee of, quote, unbiased and discreet persons, unquote. The axiomata was given to the elector, and it strengthened his resolve to protect Luther. Of all the German princes to support Luther, the most important were the Wetten electors of Saxony. In 1485, Saxony was divided between the brothers Albrecht and Ernst, with Ernst getting the title of elector in such territories as Wittenberg, Torgau, Weimar, Gotha, Coburg, and southern Thuringia. Albrecht got the title Duke in northern Thuringia, Leipzig, Dresden, Meissen. So I'll give you a sense of what we're talking about here. Whoops, no, we can't. Don't worry. Don't, 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 don't worry about it. Uh, I should have pointed it out on the map the first time. But uh, if you want to see Germany, uh, we're talking about Saxony in two parts. There's Ernstein uh, Saxony and Albertine Saxony. 
Uh, Ernstein's where Luther lives, that's where the elector is. Albertine is where Duke George will see him. One is for Luther, one's opposed Luther, and they're just situated right there on the east side in the middle. Over to the left, you'll find the, the land grave of uh, Hesse, so they're almost contiguous here. So when we get this alliance between Saxony and Hesse, they're neighbors, and they're right there in the middle. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The son of Ernst was Frederick the Wise, the supporter of Luther. The son of Albrecht was Georg, who became, after the Leipzig debate in 1519, which he sponsored, an ardent opponent of Luther. Frederick the Wise was considered a pious Catholic. In 1493, he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. His castle in Wittenberg contained a relic collection of 19,013 items. His principal advisors were two priests, Georg Burkhardt, known by his humanist name Vespalatin from his birthplace of Spalt near Nuremberg, and the Augustinian friar Johann von Staupitz, a childhood friend of Frederick. Next to the Habsburgs, the Wettins were the most important princes in the empire. Frederick was rich due to silver mines in his territory. He was known as peace-loving, and a leader among the seven electors of the empire. When Leo X looked for an alternative candidate to Charles Habsburg, he didn't want him to be emperor because he would box in the papal states because Charles was also king of Naples and to the north as uh, emperor, he would be in control of Milan and the papal states would be in the vice. And the Pope said, we do not want to be dominated by one man. We do not want the Pope who has to be the common father of all Christendom become the chaplain of one prince. And if you elect Charles V as emperor, the danger is he's gonna dominate the papacy and the pope will be reduced to the chaplain of the emperor. So the pope was adamant not to have Charles elected as emperor, he lost. Uh, uh, he tried to push Frederick as the candidate, but Frederick wouldn't have anything to do with it. And the electors were bought basically by the Habsburgs and Charles was elected as emperor and Leo had to make his peace and accept it. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so uh, Frederick had, uh, was an important person. Um, in 1502, Frederick founded a university in Wittenberg as a rival to that in Albertine, Leipzig. Luther became a professor of biblical theology there in 1512. By 1516, he was still considered so obscure as not to be mentioned in a list of 100 most prominent theologians in Germany. The following year would change all that with his posting of the 95 Theses. They were quickly printed and distributed throughout Germany, tapping into long-standing discontent with papal indulgences that were often offered for one purpose, but whose donations were redirected to enrich local and Roman officials. Luther not only complained about indulgence practices, but in the 1519, at a disputation in Heidelberg, he defended, this time, 97 theses. These attacked the place of Aristotle in theological education and called for a study of the Bible with humanist tools. Students flocked to Wittenberg. The elector was keen to protect his star professor and the revenues these students brought to the coffers of Wittenberg. The elector's advisors were supporters of Luther. Spalatin was the elector's private secretary, court preacher, and tutor to his nephews. He mediated between the elector and Luther. He said they never met. Frederick of Wise never met Luther personally. What was going on? Spalatin was the intermediary between the two. Uh, it was Spalatin who assured protection for the, reform, the friars' reforms of the university and religion but he could not convince the elector to take personal control of the reorganization of religious life in his territories. Stalpitz was Luther's religious superior and spiritual father. He also tried to protect Luther. As vicar general of the observant Saxon congregation of the Mendic and Augustinian hermits, the order to which Luther belonged, <clears throat> rather than disciplining Luther, Stalpitz used his authority to dispense Luther from his vows. <clears throat> Stalpitz then resigned his office and went to Salzburg <clears throat> to become court preacher and counselor to Cardinal Matthias Lang. 
from me. Frederick was concerned that Luther be treated fairly. <clears throat> he intervened to prevent his summons to Rome, but arranged instead his audience in Augsburg in October of 1518 with the papal legate, Cardinal Tommaso de Vio, a famous Thomas theologian. The cardinal asked Luther to recant his, he, he read all of Luther's writings and said, now really what's wrong here? Uh, what do I need to get Luther to recant? You know, some of the stuff, well, you can argue this stuff back and forth, <clears throat> disputed among theologians, but I, I think I found one proposition here that Luther has to recant. If he recants on this one, we can solve the problem. What was the thing that he demanded that Luther recant? The proposition claiming that papal indulgences absolve only ecclesiastical penalties and have no effect on one standing before God. So if you get an indulgence, it absolves ecclesiastical penalties, uh, like having to fast or do various or pay a fee or whatnot. And it says, these indulgences have nothing to do with your standing before God. And Cajetan said, that doesn't work. You can't claim that about indulgences. What Christ said to Peter, what you bind on earth shall be bound on earth. What you bind, what you loosen shall be loosed in heaven. It has an effect in heaven, what you do. Uh, and Luther would not back down on that one. Uh, uh, he told the Cajetan, that's your opinion. That's what you Dominicans say. That's not what other theologians say. Cajetan said, okay, you want an official position on this? I'll go back to Rome and get you one. So when Cajetan went back to Rome, he got Leo X to issue a bull spelling out Cajetan's view on indulgences. When Luther got a hold of the bull, he read it and said, this bull is worthless. These are nothing but asserting papal authority. Where's the, where's the argument from sacred scripture? There's no argument from sacred scripture. This is a piece of junk. Threw it out. So uh, there's where we got the, the, the nub of the problem here in the early stages. Uh, the other early problem was at this debate in uh, Augsburg, uh, they got on the question of uh, authority. In the, but this always comes down to a question of authority. And uh, the uh, uh basically claimed that uh, the council that had just met down in Rome, the Fifth Lateran Council, it ended in March, this, uh, a year later we're talking in Augsburg in 1518, uh, March of 1517, this is uh, October 1518, he said that that council had abolished, abrogated the Council of Basel. So you can't argue from the decrees of the Council of Basel. Luther, what are you talking about? One council, ecumenical council, abolishing another ecumenical council? He says, if that's the case, what confidence can you put in the decrees of an ecumenical council if one can abolish the other one? Uh, and where, where do you find truth? Where do you find security? If church authorities can change things back and forward, where do you find truth? The only place you can find truth is the word of God in sacred scripture. So Cajetan, uh, did Cajetan really say that at the, council, at the meeting in Augsburg? I think he probably, Luther probably misunderstood him because uh, the Lateran Council did not abolish uh, the, the Council of Basel. It got rid of one decree, a disciplinary decree of Basel, but not a doctrinal one. But anyway, Luther used this as an argument for dismissing church authority because they contradict each other. It's only sacred scripture is the safe one. So we have here now uh, this meeting. And uh, when the bull Exerge Domine was issued in Rome demanding that Luther recant 41 propositions, Frederick refused to implement it and demanded that Luther be given a fair hearing before the German Diet before being subjected to any condemnation. Having arranged never to receive an official copy of the Edict of Worms outlawing Luther, the elector continued to protect him. Luther was careful not to cross his protector. When Luther's ideas about the freedom of the Christian got mixed up with economic and social grievances on the part of German tenant farmers, a rebellion broke out against lay and ecclesiastical landlords. Luther initially tried to mediate the conflict in April of 1525, but fearing anarchy and the demise of his movement, if it were to be tied to the rebellion, Luther openly sided with the princes on May 6th, one day after the death of his protector, Elector Frederick. Luther urged the princes to slaughter the rebels. 
which the combined armies of both Catholic and Lutheran princes did, killing an estimated 100,000 farmers. Frederick had not participated in the violent suppression of the rebellion. He also never had direct personal relationship with Luther. But that the elector had adopted Luther's theological positions is suggested by his receiving communion under both species on his deathbed on May 5th. Without a legitimate heir, Frederick was succeeded by his younger brother. John the Steadfast, as he was known, co-ruled with his brother for a while, but then assumed control of Thuringia with his residence in Weimar. Early on, he supported the reformers, even the radicals, until the peasant revolt. In May of 1525, he succeeded his brother as elector and joined with Philip of Hesse in military action against the rebel peasants. When the Catholic princes, the elector Joachim of Brandenburg, his brother, Cardinal Archbishop Elector Albrecht of Mainz, Duke George of Albertine, Saxony, and Duke Henry the Younger of Braunschweig, Wolfenbüttel, formed the League of Dessau in 1525, a Catholic League. John joined with Philip of Hesse to form the League of Torgau, a Lutheran League, that included such imperial free cities as Nuremberg. They did this in 1526. Luther would not support this league. He thought it was wrong to go against imperial authority, that you should not do this. At the Diet of Spire in June of 1526, John succeeded in getting some Catholic princes to join with the Lutheran evangelicals in refusing to implement the Edict of Worms out of fear that to do so, to implement it, would increase the power of Charles V. John worked to establish the Lutheran reform in his territories, sending out visitors to check up on the local churches in 1527-28. At the Diet of Spire in 1529, where you get the word Protestant, they were protestantes, protesting against implementing the Edict of Worms, uh, John, John the Steadfast once again secured the cooperation of evangelical princes, such as Philip of Hesse and the Prince of Anhalt, in 14 imperial cities, together with some moderate Catholic rulers, such as the Elector Joachim of Brandenburg, in refusing to implement the Edict of Worms. He attended with Philip Melanchthon the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, where he presented the statement of beliefs of the evangelicals that became known as the Augsburg Confession. When his hope was disappointed that Emperor Charles would concede toleration to the Protestants, John joined the Schmalkaldic League on February 27, 1531. Its commanders were the two, Elector John and Landgrave Philip of Hesse. Its other members eventually included some northern princes, Brandenburg Ansbach, Brandenburg Kirschmann, Mecklenburg, Mansfeld, Pomerania, and Prussia, and cities such as Magdeburg, Nuremberg, Augsburg, Lübeck, Bremen, and southern cities of Strasbourg, Constance, Ulm, Memmingen, Biberach, Landau, and Isny. John tried to secure the cooperation of Bavaria in any opposition to the Habsburgs. Luther had initially refused to back any armed resistance to imperial authority, but jurists pointed out that imperial law allowed one to resist a manifestly unjust act. And what's an unjust act? Mandating the restoration of Catholic cult is an obviously unjust act. In his warning to his dear German people of 1531, Luther stated that should an emperor fight against the gospel and try to impose the false doctrines of papists, the people had the right to resist. When Elector John died in 1532, he was succeeded by his son, known as John Frederick the Magnanimous. From his youth, he was a supporter of Luther, having been tutored by Spalatin. He brought the clergy under tighter control and dissolved the monasteries. Although inclined to peace and compromise, he resisted the proposal of Pope Paul III in 1536 to call a council to resolve the conflicts. The Elector did, however, send theologians to the religious colloquies of Worms and Regensburg that a, sought a theological compromise. During the Schmalkaldic War, John was a leader of the forces that initially scored victories over imperial armies. Luther died on February 18, 1546, 
during this stage of the war when the Lutherans were winning. The arrival, however, of reinforcements and the temporary withdrawal of Philip of Hesse from the conflict allowed imperial troops to make a surprise attack by fording the Elbe River and to rout the forces of Electoral Saxony at Mulberg. John was captured during the retreat on April 24, 1547, deposed and held in captivity until 1552. His cousin, Moritz of Albertine Saxony, a fellow Lutheran, succeeded to his title and lands. Next to the electors of Saxony, the principal supporter of Luther was Philip of Hesse. He was also a major opponent of the Habsburgs, even before Luther arrived on the scene. The reason for his animosity was the disputed inheritance of 1479 of the territory known as Katznellenbogen that extended the borders of Hesse to the Rhine River and allowed it to charge tolls on the trade along the river, big source of revenue. The county of Nassau, however, separated Hesse from its Katzenellenbogen lands, and the count of Nassau, who contested the inheritance, was supported by the Habsburgs. So the Habsburgs are dragged into this conflict between Nassau and Hesse. An additional basis for the antagonism was the ouster of Duke Ulrich Budelbach of Württemberg, a relative of Philip, from his German territories organized by the Schwabian League led by the Habsburgs. The League turned the Duchy of Württemberg over to the Habsburgs to manage until it was given officially to Frederick Habsburg in 1520. Philip was already familiar with the ideas of Luther when at the age of 16 he met him in the end in Worms in 1521 and became his ardent supporter. This did not prevent him, however, from supporting the electoral archbishop of Trier, Richard von Griefenklau, in his struggle with Franz von Sickingen, the protector of various reformers in what was known as the Knights' War from 1522 to 23. Nor did it prevent him from marrying in 1523 Christina, the daughter of Duke Georg of Saxony, an ardent opponent of Luther. So you're marrying the daughter of Luther's big opponent. In 1525, his forces helped to put down the Peasants' Revolt, which was led by the radical reformer Thomas Munster, a revolt Luther had denounced. To protect the Lutheran Reformation, he helped to form the League of Torgau in 1526. With the cooperation of the Estates of Hesse, he consolidated the reform in his territory, dissolving monasteries and establishing with their revenues hospitals and the University of Marburg. Realizing the importance of a military alliance among the reformers, he sponsored the Colloquy of Marburg in 1529, at which Luther and Zwingli came to a consensus on many issues, but failed on the Eucharist. When Emperor Charles V rejected the Lutheran Confession of Belief at the Diet of Augsburg, the Protestant princes united in the Schmalkaldic League with Philip as one of its two military leaders. He succeeded in uniting the neighbors of Württemberg and secured the support of Francis I of France for a campaign that successfully restored his relative Ulrich as Duke of Württemberg in 1534. In that same year, in the hope of getting the sympathetic Prince Bishop of Munster, Franz von Waldeck, to convert to Lutheranism, Philip made a military alliance with him and assisted him in removing the Anabaptists from his cathedral city of Munster. The marital situation of Philip caused him to be cautious. His wife Christina, the daughter of the Catholic Duke Georg of Saxony and the mother of his seven children, fled his court and returned to Saxony. Philip wanted to marry his mistress, Marguerite van der Sal, and sought Luther's advice. Luther and Melanchthon gave confessional counsel, invoking the freedom of the Christian man and granting their approval, provided the marriage was kept secret. The bigamous secret marriage of 1540 with Melanchthon as a witness, however, made Philip liable to punishment under imperial law. Bigamy was forbidden by imperial law. They didn't have divorce. He never divorced uh, Christina, he just had a second marriage. Henceforth, he had to tread lightly. Philip sought 
So Philip supported the efforts to find a religious compromise at the colloquies of Hagenau, Worms, and Regensburg. When these failed, and in order to give territorial integrity to the Protestant Schmalkaldic League and to protect the Lutheran city of Glossar, Philip got its members to attack and conquer the Catholic Duchy of Braunschweig in 1542. When Charles V finally got a free hand to deal with Protestants following the Peace of Crepe in 1544, with Francis I and the truce with the Ottoman Turks in 1546, Philip convinced the League to make preemptive strikes. But Charles secured Italian troops from Pope Paul III, reinforcements from the Spanish and Netherlands territories, and the support of such Protestant princes as Duke Moritz of Albertine Saxony. When Philip failed to recognize the danger, retreating to Hesse for winter quarters, his ally, John Frederick, was defeated at Mulberg in 1547. Moritz convinced Philip to surrender to the emperor, who then imprisoned him in the Netherlands until 1552, when Moritz secured his release and restoration to power. Philip's diplomatic skills and earlier militancy had helped to preserve the Lutheran cause. Of the German princes who were openly hostile to Luther, this guy here, Georg Wetten, the bearded, Duke of Albertine Saxony was prominent. Initially sympathetic to Luther, he was turned off by Luther's espousal of Hussite propositions at the Leipzig debate he had sponsored in 1519. As a youth, Georg was destined for an ecclesiastical career, being trained in theology and secular subjects. But he resigned his benefices when his father called him to take over secular administrative tasks. When he took over the duchy on his father's death, he made it a prosperous territory, patronized in the humanities and arts, and promoted a reform of the church, notably of monasteries. At the Diet of Worms, he supported the edict outlawing Luther. He tried to keep his duchy free of Lutheran influences. They were right next door in his cousins, Ernstein, Saxony. And he tried to prevent his fellow princes from abandoning the Roman church. He wrote and published defenses of Catholic teaching and encouraged others to do the same. His city of Leipzig became a center of Catholic controversialist publications. Politically, he favored a policy of peace with Protestant neighbors, but in 1526, he joined the Defense of Catholic League of Dessau. Meanwhile, his brother Henry converted to Lutheranism. When all of Georg's sons died, the duchy passed to his brother, who undid all his work trying to defend Catholicism and turned uh, Albertine Saxony into a Lutheran territory quickly. Now we talk about another dynasty in France and uh, Germany among the, the princes. This is the Hohenzollerns. The Hohenzollern brothers, Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz and Elector Joachim of Brandenburg, also supported the old church. Albrecht, this is the Archbishop of Mainz, attitudes toward Luther evolved over time. He was sympathetic to humanism and had among his advisors supporters of church reform. He needed money to pay for the various dispensations he needed to hold simultaneously the sees of Halberstadt, Magdeburg, and Mainz. And this need of money led him to allow the preaching of an indulgence in his territories to help pay for the construction of the new Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. When Luther contested this indulgence, Albrecht sent Luther's 95 Theses to Rome for a judgment. Whether due to his failure to recognize the theological implications of Luther's teachings or from a desire to prevent open rebellion, he avoided countersigning the Edict of Worms and delayed implementing the condemnation of Luther. Only when the Knights War, that's 1522 to 23, seemed to threaten ecclesiastical principalities did he take action to prevent the spread of Lutheran ideas in his territories. He did not attend the Regensburg Conference of June and July of 1524, at which the Cardinal Legate Lorenzo Campeggio, the Prince Cardinal Archbishop of Salzburg, Matthias Lang, the Prince Bishop of Trent, Bernard von Cleese, and representatives of 10 Southern German bishoprics, together with Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, and Dukes Wilhelm and Ludwig of Bavaria issued 38 sweeping reform decrees and formed a political league 
to prevent the spread of heresy. But in November, in November of 1526, a year, two years later, Albrecht did hold a provincial conference of the suffragan bishops in Landau, which ordered the implementation of the reform decrees of Regensburg. Albrecht worked to bring Catholic and Protestant princes together, but with the failure of the colloquy of Leipzig in 1534, he took a firm stance in defense of traditional Catholicism, looking to a general council to define the Catholic position. When the Habsburgs tried to find a compromise with the Protestants, Albrecht resisted their efforts. Within his own territory, he found himself helpless when various cities and regions went over to Lutheranism, Halberstadt, Magdeburg, Erfurt, Halle, Eichfeld. His Catholic allies proved ineffectual and the burden of financial debt prevented him from taking other measures. In an effort to strengthen the old faith in his territories, he did promote better theological education of the clergy and preaching to the laity. His brother, Elector Joachim I, known as Nestor, was a staunch opponent of Luther. He tried to implement the Edict of Worms in his territories. He blamed the present Peasants' War on Luther and joined the defense of League of Dessau. To secure the loyalty of his son, Joachim II, to the Catholic faith, he had him marry successfully the daughters of Catholic rulers. But his own wife, Elizabeth, the daughter of the King of Denmark, converted to Lutheranism in 1527 and fled to Saxony. After his death, his son, John of Brandenburg Kirsten, joined the Schmalkaldic League in 1537. His principal heir, Joachim II, tried to find a middle ground, adopting Lutheran theology, but retaining Catholic ceremonial practices. The church ordinances this son adopted in 1540 received the approval of both Luther and Charles V. His Polish wife, Hedwig, remained Catholic, and Joachim refused to join the Schmalkaldic League, but joined with four Charles V in the defeat of John Frederick of Saxony and tried to implement the Augsburg Interim of 1548, but later in his life he became more openly Lutheran. The next Catholic leader is this man, Henrik or Heinrich uh, V, Welch, uh, Welch, the younger of Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel. He tried to retain the Catholic faith in his territory, but Heinrich was driven from his lands by the Schmalkaldic League in 1542. They, they wanted to make sure that there was a, a land bridge between the Lutherans in the north and over in Saxony, and Wolfenbüttel, Bromberg stood in between. So Philip of Hesse said, let's go get, get, get that territory. They used the pretext of trying to protect the city of Glossar, but they succeeded in driving out Heinrich and taking over the territory. But then when Charles V was victorious at Mulberg, he reinstalled Heinrich in his territory. Many of the cities in the duchy, however, had gone over to Protestantism and they resisted any re-Catholicization. Heinrich's affair with his mistress over there, Eva von Trout, who provided him with 14 illegitimate children, was well known and became the occasion for Luther's writing Wieder Hans Wurz, or Against the Buffoon, uh, in which he called the, the Duke openly a buffoon and attacked his extramarital lifestyle. When Heinrich's Protestant son, Julius, succeeded him in 1568, the duchy was quickly and systematically transformed into a Lutheran land. So who else do we have defending the Catholic cause? Uh, down in Bavaria, we have the Wittelbach brothers, uh, Dukes, Wilhelm IV and Ludwig X. They co-ruled the duchy, centralizing power and defending the old faith, while often following an anti-Habsburg policy. Why would you be anti-Habsburg when the Habsburgs are trying to defend Catholicism? Because they didn't want Charles V to have too much power, and they were jealous that his brother, Ferdinand, had become king of Bohemia, and they were the rivals for the crown of Bohemia. So the Bavarians are Catholics, but they're anti-Habsburgs, uh, which creates problems. Nonetheless, between 1522 and 24, the Dukes ordered the implementation of the Edict of Worms, prohibiting the publication and discussion of Luther's writings, forbidding any changes in church services, and executing Luther's followers who were found mostly in urban areas. 
When the Cardinal Legate, we mentioned before, Lorenzo Campeggio, held a conference in Regensburg to reform the Catholic Church, the Wittelbach Dukes attended it and tried to implement its uh, uh, reform degrees and also entered into a military alliance known sometimes as the Corpus Catholicorum or also known as the Regensburg Union. This alliance was out to implement the reform decrees and enforce the edicts of Worms against Luther and his followers. With papal permission, the Bavarian dukes ordered visitations of monasteries and the secular punishment of criminal clerics. Those decrees of Regensburg Conference, however, were never adopted in northern Germany. They stayed uh, only down in southern Germany. Due to their Habsburg, due to their hostility to the Habsburgs over Frederick Ferdinand becoming king of Bohemia, the Bavarian dukes reversed course and at the Diet of Spire in 1526, voted to suspend the implementation of the Edict of Worms until a church council decided the theological issues. They also formed an alliance later in 1531 with Philip of Hesse and Elector John of Saxony, the two leading Protestant leaders. But fear of political unrest in the empire led the dukes to shift allegiances once again. Albrecht IV, the magnanimous, the son of Duke Wilhelm, an eventual heir to the whole duchy, was married to a daughter of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. But Albrecht was more tolerant and Protestantism spread among the nobility. When radical nobles became involved in a conspiracy against him, Albrecht cracked down on them in 1565 and ordered regular visitations starting in 1567 to ensure religious conformity to the old faith. The principal Catholic German prince to oppose Luther was Charles V, grandson of Emperor Maximilian I, inheritor of his father, Philip of Burgundy, of lands within the empire that stretched from the Netherlands up the Rhine to territories in Alsace and Breisgau, across Swabia to Austria. From his mother, Juana the Mad of Castile, he inherited Spain with his possessions in the New World and the islands of Sardinia and Sicily and the Kingdom of Naples. Such enormous power and wealth stirred opposition to him from neighboring rulers, both within the empire and on its borders. The most important of the opponents, of course, were the French kings, Francis I of France, and down in Italy, none other. Who's opposing Charles V? The Pope, uh, Clement VII. Raised in Brussels at the court of his aunt, Margaret, regent of the Netherlands, and tutored by Adrian Didel, an earlier opponent of Luther and later elected Pope Adrian VI, Charles took seriously his obligation as emperor to protect the church. His speech in Worms in 1521, in which he pledged his fortune and even his life to eliminate the Lutheran heresy, raises the question of why did he fail to achieve his goal? The answer lies in a combination of factors. The German princes, as mentioned before, feared that he would try to centralize power in his hands. His paternal grandfather, Maximilian I, had tried to do that, but was effectively resisted by the electoral princes. His maternal grandparents, Isabel and Ferdinand, were more successful in doing that in Spain. And his fellow rulers in England and France were engaged in the same process. So everybody knew these guys were trying to centralize power, and Charles was trying to do it in Germany, and we're not going to let him do it. The Catholic German princes would ally with their Lutheran neighbors to prevent the implementation of the Edict of Worms for fear it would increase the power of Charles. Even Pope Clement VII sought to weaken the emperor while he was trying to suppress Protestantism. Think of that. The emperor is trying to weaken Charles V while he's trying to suppress Protestantism. Ponder that. The Pope allied with the emperor's rival, Francis I. The capture of the French king at Pavia on February 24, 1525, and his subsequent imprisonment in Madrid raised papal fears of being dominated by the Habsburg prince. These were confirmed in a dramatic way when the papal alliance with France, known as the League of Cognac, signed on May 26, 1526, resulted in the sack of Rome in the imprisonment of the Pope in Castel San Angelo in 1527. 
and Clement was forced eventually to crown Charles as Holy Roman Emperor in a ceremony in Bologna in 1529. If the Pope made peace with Charles, the French did not. France continued to oppose Charles V, making alliances with both the German Protestant princes, this is the most Christian king uh, who uh, receives uh, control of the church in France. What is he doing? He's making an alliance with the German Lutherans against Charles, who's trying to suppress heresy. And he's also, believe it or not, making an alliance with the Sultan of the Ottoman Turks, giving him port facilities and uh, waiting, helping him. So when Charles V, here he is, poor guy, trying to deal with the Lutherans. Uh, as soon as he tries to deal with them, uh, and try, the uh, French come in and stab him on one side, and the one he's watching, and then the Turks come in on the other side, caught in the middle. Um, why didn't he succeed? Eh, it's not too hard to figure this one out. Um, so to defend the empire from the advancing Turks who occupied two-thirds of Hungary after their victory at Mohosh in 1526 where they killed the king of Hungary, um, and then they started advancing on Vienna in 1529, they captured Budapest in 1541. How do you stop these Turks? Uh, Charles needed the military assistance of the Lutheran princes and hence gave them temporary tolerance pending a decision on religious questions by a general council. When absent from Germany, Charles, because he was king of Spain and um, he had many irons in the fire, when absent from Germany, Charles turned affairs over to his brother, Ferdinand. Ferdinand had been raised at the court of their grandfather, Fernando II of Aragon, and when Charles became Holy Roman Emperor, he resigned his southern German possessions to his brother, who then became Archduke of Austria. He was also, as mentioned earlier, briefly Duke of Württemberg from 1530 to 34, until Philip of Hesse defeated his forces and reinstalled, reinstalled Ulrich as Duke. Ferdinand was a conscientious but moderate Catholic who tried to defend the church. He was on very good terms with Erasmus and supported various religious settlements. When Charles negotiated the truce with France, a piece of crepe mentioned earlier in 1544 and the truce with the Ottoman Turks in 1546, he saw an opportunity to settle once and for all the religious question in Germany. When Paul III finally convened a council at Trent in December of 1545, the Lutherans refused to attend it. Fearing that they might be forced to submit to his decisions, the Schmalkaldic League took the initiative by attacking the imperial forces near Regensburg. But with reinforcements from the Netherlands, Spain, and the Papal States, and with the help of the ambitious Lutherans, Moritz of Ducal Saxony and Albrecht of brandenburg Ansbach, Charles was victorious at Mulberg, capturing the elector John Frederick of Saxony and securing the surrender of Philip of Hesse. When the victorious Charles V entered Wittenberg, and he went to the castle chapel where Luther was buried, there he stood, there was the man at warmed where he said, I will make sure you are done for, you will not get away with this. There he stands victorious before the grave of Martin Luther. Now in the old days, when you hit an arch heretic, what did you do with them? Even if they were dead, you know, Huss was burned at the stake at Constance, and they threw his ashes, scattered them. Wycliffe, they dug his body up and burnt it. So here he is, victorious. There's Luther's body sitting there in the floor of the, the chapel. He decided, let him in peace. I will not do what my predecessors had done. He let him in peace. Um, 26 years earlier, he had pledged his kingdom, his blood, his very life and soul to see that heresy did not infect the empire. Luther's views, however, had become fixed in the minds and hearts of numerous, numerous Germans. It would be very difficult to remove them. Charles sought to impose a resolution to the religious conflict by issuing what was known as the Augsburg Interim of 1548 that contained an ambiguous statement on justification, double justification, but retained Catholic doctrine on other issues, but allowed Lutherans to have clerical marriage 
and communion under both species until or unless a general council decided otherwise. This interim was not implemented in electoral Saxony and barely in Brandenburg, nor in the major cities of northern Germany. Charles V, nonetheless, forced the Lutherans to send a delegation to the reopened Council of Trent, where they were greeted by the three ecclesiastical electors, Mainz, Cologne, and Trier, and by numerous German prince bishops. They were welcome when they came to Trent. They sent them to dinners, and we can finally resolve these issues. But Rome insisted that the Lutherans agree to submit to the council's decisions before they could be incorporated into it, while the Protestants demanded that the council start from scratch, forget all the stuff you had done earlier, wipe it out and start all over again, because we're finally here and we can discuss this thing, and also, no pope running this thing through his legates in charge. This is going to be an open council. Negotiations stalled. Meanwhile, Moritz organized a League of Lutheran Princes with the support of Henry II of France. With the threat of renewed warfare, the German prince bishops hurried back to Germany to protect their territories, and the council was once again suspended. Charles, due to this new revolt, which he couldn't put down, was forced to agree to the religious peace of Augsburg of 1555 that granted to each ruler the right to determine the religion of his territory, once again, until a church council defines Christian doctrine. Pope Paul IV, Carafa, accused the emperor of having abandoned his responsibilities by tolerating heresy. And Charles proceeded to resign his titles to his son, Philip II of Spain, and his brother, Ferdinand of Austria, and he went and retired to a monastery in Spain. His brother's son, this is Ferdinand's son, Emperor Maximilian II, in a weakened military position, and fearing that renewed hostilities would prove disastrous to the Catholic cause, agreed at the Diet of Augsburg in 1565 that the decrees of the Council of Trent would not be imposed on all of the emperor, all, all the empire, and that the religious peace of Augsburg with the status quo of 1552 would now be permanent. Each German prince could determine religion of his territory. Luther could rest in peace in Wittenberg and Charles in Catholic Escorial. The end of this, of this chapter of the story. So I welcome any questions you may have because we covered an awful lot of ground here and uh, blah, 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 all these names. Maybe we should go back to the original, very first one. The map might help explain some of this uh, since we were doing all these princes. Uh, this, uh, so this is uh, the territory of Luther's prince, of Frederick the Wise. Over here is Hesse, the big ally. So this chunk of Germany is Lutheran. Of course, when uh, Georg dies and his uh, brother takes over, uh, then that becomes Lutheran. And this is down here in Württemberg, is, where is Württemberg? Down in the area over here. Uh, that becomes Lutheran. So you get this whole stretch of Lutheranism in here. And then Brandenburg becomes Lutheran. They conquer, remember Braunschweig, uh, Henry, uh, son uh, Julius becomes a Lutheran. And then this our bishopric up here becomes Lutheran. Uh, we have uh, Mecklenburg becomes Lutheran, Pomerania. So this whole chunk of Germany becomes Lutheran stretching down to here. And of course, the, that eventually becomes Calvinist. Uh, but this is the Habsburg lands, the uh, yellow. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of some German princes in the Reformation. I gave you a long, big cast of characters. And their names are swimming in your head. You all saw the beards and the mustaches and the fancy hats. Uh, these were quite a cast of characters. Uh, when you read about them, uh, you know, we pointed out, uh, you know, uh, Heinrich having a mistress with uh, 14 kids and uh, Philip of Hesse with his girlfriend, his second marriage. Oh, these guys notoriously <laughs> having mistresses on the side. Uh, and as you, I don't know whether you know this period, but a new disease had come into Europe at the time, syphilis. A lot of these guys had syphilis. What a cast of characters. Um, so this are the people who are uh, determining the religious uh, affiliation of, of the empire. 
But I'm sure you have some questions for me, so I welcome any you might have. Go ahead. Yes. Can you, can you, can you, go ahead. Yes, okay. okay. So, overall, okay. So, overall, would you say that the, um, the Reformation helped Germany consolidate, or did it or did it just really split it apart even further than it already was? It split it apart even more. It gave new, new reasons for uh, not getting along. We, before you had political reasons, now you have religious reasons. Uh, and this uh, goes on into the 17th century with the famous 30 Years War, uh, where they slug it out for 30 years and nobody can ultimately win. And they come up with the, the Peace Treaty of Westphalia, which divides Germany uh, religiously. I, I don't know whether you know, I mean, I, my name's Minnick, it's German. Uh, and uh, my family tree goes back. And, uh, you know, I'm, I have some Lutherans, uh, my grandfather, you know, and uh, Catholics. And uh, they told the story. I mean, these divisions on religious grounds uh, today in Germany, you know, there's still, there's still divisions on religion. It's not as what it used to be. But uh, there were pretty hostile uh, feelings on questions of religion back in the 19th century. Probably, and there was certain discrimination in Germany against Catholics. Catholics were considered intellectually inferior. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Lutherans kind of ran the government, the Prussians, and they held uh, the important offices and whatnot frequently. Uh, and they were frequently in the universities and whatnot. And uh, there was kind of a looking down on those, those, those you know, the Bavarians with their feathers in their hat and their later hosens, you know, uh, boobs, you know. Uh, of course, if you want to have a good time, the word of the Germans go, if you want to have a good time, you go south to, to Bavaria or, or you go to Italy, that you know, have a good time down there. Uh, so these Catholics have beautiful art and they know how to have a good time, but, you know, we, we Lutherans are, you know, we're upper cuffs, you know, we're, we're intellectuals and we, we know how to run things. So these divisions, uh, the Reformation did not bring Germany together. It gave uh, extra reasons for uh, divisions in, in Germany. And we get a third element coming in here. We get Calvinism coming in. Uh, this religious piece of Augsburg was between Catholics and Lutherans. Uh, but what are you going to do when the Platonate becomes Calvinist? Or when the elector of Brandenburg becomes a Calvinist? Uh, what are we going to do with this? Uh, so we got a big problem here. Eventually, with the religious piece of, of with the piece of Westphalia, we include the Calvinists in this too. Uh, so each ruler can determine the, uh, the religion of his own territory. So religion becomes a, uh, a reinforcement of some of these divisions. Some rulers actually became Protestant uh, of different denominations in order to be different from their neighbor to give an extra reason for why we here in this territory are Calvinists versus our cousins over there next door who are Lutherans. Does that help? Andy? Yeah, even though at, uh, at least one point during your lecture, both the Protestants and the Catholics seem to band together. Against the Habsburgs, yeah. yes. We don't want that. Well, they, the Habsburgs could not pull it off. They could not centralize power in Germany and they had to give up. And all the cuius regio et eus religio, let it alone. My grandfather, Max, tried it, and he couldn't get it just before the Reformation. We can't pull it off in Germany. You know, Germany's never got unified until the 19th century, you know, uh, and uh, because they had all these divisions. And it was because the Prussians basically took over that they won. There was a question back there. No, I, I don't need that. I, I'm going to ask the professor if you would use my laser pointer and do the map all over again because I couldn't see anything. Okay, okay. Here you are. Okay. And I think this you, this doesn't help? No. Okay, use yours. So what do you want me to point out on there? I, 
this explains the map once more. Okay, the map. So this is Germany before the Reformation, uh, and it points out the major territories. The yellow ones are Habsburg territories, okay? This is what Charles V inherits. The purple stuff, purple gray, are prince bishoprics. Now some of these are going to go Lutheran. Uh, when he becomes a Lutheran, he secularizes it and becomes a prince without, you know, without being a bishop. Uh, the uh, territory over here, which you don't see here, is the, the Teutonic order. Uh, and the head of the Teutonic, was a, uh, a group of religious order of knights. Uh, and uh, the ruler of that uh, went Lutheran and converted the territory. He became the duke, the Prussian duke. Uh, so that's where, where the Prussians actually come from is this crusading order over here. Um, this is the kingdom of Bohemia. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, that's one of the uh, seven electors. Uh, this is Hungary here. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the Turks are coming up and conquering it. They got two thirds of it, basically this whole area here. A little sliver of it was left. And because of the famous marriage, which Max Max couldn't unify the empire. So he had to come up with another strategy. How do we promote the Habsburgs? Marriage, marriage, that's what we do. We marry the Habsburgs into all the royal families of Europe. But I got a grand scheme. He took his two uh, grandchildren and he married them to the two children of the king of Hungary, Bohemia. What a deal. The son marries the daughter, the daughter marries the king, and they make a deal that if the king dies, Without an heir, the crown passes to a sister who marries to a Habsburg. So what happens in 1526 when uh, Louis goes out and takes on the, the Turks and gets killed? The crown passes to his sister, and she's married to Ferdinand of Habsburg. So when you talk about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where does that come from? The Hungarian part of it? From this marriage uh, that the Habsburgs now got the crown of Hungary. And with the crown of Hungary comes Bohemia. Uh, so this is the beginning of the, because Max was a shrewdy. He was marrying his kids off all over the place. And uh, it, it pays off. Uh, uh, you know, Philip marries, Philip, Charles V should not have gotten this, but Max married his son, Philip of, uh, of Burgundy, to the daughter of Isabel and Ferdinand. She wasn't supposed to succeed to the crown. She had an older brother, Juan. But Juan dies. So the crown of Castile and Aragon passes to his sister, Juana. And she's married to Max's son, Philip. And their kid is Charles V. So Maximilian, you don't let me unify Germany. I got other plans. I know how to get power. I got all these grandkids here. I'm going to marry them off all over the place. The Habsburgs were married all over the place. And it all came to Charles. Uh, paid off. Big deal. So uh, what else can I show you on here? Um, so that's the Lutheran area here. That's the two Saxonies, Albertine and, uh, Ernstein and Albertine. Uh, and that's Hesse over here. And then he has a bit of territory on the other side along the, the Rhine River um, that uh, um, Katzen, Nellenbogen, which here's Nassau between it. And that territory gives him a lot of money. And, but that caused the animosity with the Habsburgs. Uh, so I know. What else do you want to know about the map? Well, it looks like that uh, uh, Charles V has a pincer. Oh, and everybody felt that too. We got to stop this man. He's too powerful. He's got to surround it. So this gang, we don't want this guy to win. So we have religious differences. Forget about the religious differences. We don't want him dominating us. So let's put aside our religious differences. You Protestants, let's unite. Let's not. End we don't want this guy to get any stronger. If you were Francis I of France, you say, oh my God, look it, we don't have France on here. I look out my window to the, to the east, what do we got? The Habsburgs, all up down my borders here. I look across the English Channel, what do I have over there? The aunt of Charles V, Catherine of Aragon. I look to the south over the Pyrenees, what do I have? Charles again, Carlos this time, uh, he controls all of Spain. I look down to the south over here, and what do we find? We find Milan over here. And as Holy Roman Empire, he's got a claim on Milan. <coughs> we French have a claim on Naples. Who, who's running Naples? Charles V. The guy's got everything. If we don't watch out, he's going to clobber us. 
So we have to, you know, we got to get some friends here. We got to stop this guy. So you got, you know, uh, Francis I, a Catholic king, the most Christian king, making alliances. Who with? The Ottoman Turks uh, with the, uh, the Lutheran princes to stop Charles V from unifying power. They're afraid of this guy. He's like the world emperor. He's got the Americas. He's got the Philippines. What more does this guy want? He could take over the whole world. Stop him. Uh, yes? So based on that, Based on that, do you think many of the princes made their decisions to convert or not convert to Protestantism based on political concerns? Or was that more? Well, I think it's a, it's a mixed story. I'm sure some did it out of religious conviction and some did it out of a combination, a gray area. You know, if I can, you know, uh, in the beginning it wasn't clear. You know, we got to talk about Frederick the Wise, uh, a pious Catholic, uh, defending Luther. In the beginning, is Luther really a heretic or isn't he? You know, the Pope says he is, but is the Pope the last word on this? We got theologians over here saying, no, his, his views are all right. The church certainly needs reform. Who's reforming it? The Pope's not doing much on this. Luther is. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed picture. Do I, am I, if I become a Luther, am I leaving the Catholic Church? Luther never thought he was establishing a separate church. Uh, you know, a Lutheran church. He didn't think that. He thought he was reforming the Catholic church, that he was being pushed out of the Catholic church. So a lot of these rulers, too, thought, you know, I'm the ruler. I got responsibilities. I should really, if the Pope and the bishops aren't reforming the church in my territory, I'm a Christian ruler. I have a duty to reform the church in my territory. So who's, who's giving me some ideas on it? Oh, Luther, you got some good ideas how to do this? Ah, let me hear them. Okay, uh, put the liturgy in, in the vernacular so people can understand it. That sounds like a good idea. Is, is that Catholic or is that Lutheran? That sounds like just a good idea to me. Uh, you say, you're going to go to communion? You, didn't Christ say, take and receive? This is my body, this is my blood. Then he say, take and eat and drink. Shouldn't we give communion under both species? If I do it under, is this, is this a Catholic or a Protestant thing? The Catholic Church doesn't allow me to give communion under both kinds. Luther says he, we should. The Bible seems to say we should have it under. Oh, maybe I should have communion under both kinds in my territory. So the stuff that Luther was saying, you know, is this really heresy? Uh, you know, Luther says that the clergy should marry. Where in the Bible does it say the clergy shouldn't marry? Didn't Peter have a mother? Didn't did Christ go in there and heal his mother? Uh, did the apostles, did they, you know, were, were they married or weren't they married? Uh, where's the stuff that priests can't be married? Is it in the Bible? I don't find it in the Bible. You know, so, uh, you know, this, this type of stuff was in the air, and the Luther, uh, a prince trying to reform his territory would say, oh, this makes, you know, am I really becoming a non-Catholic by doing this? Or is Luther kind of reformed Catholicism? Uh, so there's a, there's a mixture of, of things going on here. It's not really till the Council of Trent uh, defines very clearly, this is Catholic teaching, that is not. If you hold this, you're anathema, you're out of the church. But that the Council of Trent doesn't end until 1565, um, 63, pardon me, 63. And then the Pope finally, until the Pope approved the Council's decrees, they weren't official. So all the stuff they did from 45 up to 63 was not official until the Pope finally approved them with the decree <coughs> Benedictus Days. Until that time, this stuff was kind of no, well, is this true or isn't this true? Uh, remember uh, the, the, when the Protestants come to the trend, they had to scratch all that stuff and start over again. Could they have done that? The answer is yes. The Pope had not until that time approved the earlier decrees. Theoretically, the Pope could have said yes, let's stop that and let's debate this all over again because he had not formally approved it until uh, Benedictus Deus in 1564. Uh, Yes. Over here, sir. Um, professor, he um, used to make a lot of people angry. He did. He had a very crude way of saying things. Uh, he was very <laughs> blunt. Uh, barnyard talk language. He thought the Pope was antichrist, and he said so bluntly. Uh, he had a very, uh, it, was, it could be very insulting. Uh, yes. Well, he made a lot of people angry by supporting the peasants in the war. And initially. Not, by, by not supporting the peasants. That's afterwards, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about where, I haven't read much of it, but 
did he use Romans to defend that position? Uh, to that, Romans, particularly that, that unfortunate passage about obey your rulers because they're appointed by God. Uh, he used that very much so. He really believed that. It wasn't just, uh, you know, he, he theologically believed it. So with this, uh, the, the League of Torgau, he went to prove it. And when they had the Schmalkaldic League, he wasn't going to approve that. He had to get these people to say, now look at Luther, that, that's in Romans. But, you know, there are such things as laws of the empire. In the laws of the empire, we have this law saying that if the emperor tries to impose something that is manifestly wrong, you can resist him. So Luther, oh, okay. Oh, Luther. I, I can see that argument. So he, he saw that as a way of uh, finding the loophole for uh, if a ruler does something unjust and against the law, and the, the law allows you to resist them, then you can do it. So, but he was not a, a rebel in the sense of against of political authority. He very much believed in Romans and obeying a political authority. He ultimately thought that he was going to be per he was going to kill. He said, this bag of worms, I'm going to be, you know, whatever God wants. True Christians are always persecuted. He was expecting to be persecuted, maybe even be killed for his beliefs. He thought this is what, what the Christian life is all about, is suffering for your beliefs. So uh, he, wasn't, he thought he might really be... Uh, you know, killed for his beliefs. He wasn't going to oppose the, the civil ruler who's going to execute him. He thought that's what God wants. Okay. Just briefly, uh, uh, Doctor, what do you think the effect was for Luther interpreting the Bible in the German as St. Jerome did, the Latin Vulgate? Uh, what I would can you expound on that? Sure. Um, there were uh, translations of the Bible into German before Luther. Luther was not the first person to translate the Bible into German. And uh, there were other translations of the Bible into Italian and French. And, of course, the, uh, uh, the Lollards had translated into English. So the idea of translating the Bible into vernacular was not brand new with Martin Luther. Uh, what would Martin Luther do that was uh, very important? Uh, he, translate, he had a certain style of German. If you were lived in Germany at the time, there were all kinds of dialects all over the place. So if you move from one place, it's kind of hard to understand what the other guy is saying. He basically came up with standard German, Hochdeutsch. Uh, he kind of came up with a German that most people could understand. And he, he was very uh, powerful German. When he read the, 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 the Latin and translated it into German, it was a powerful German. He was a beautiful writer. Uh, so... Uh, he made the Bible accessible to people across the, the place. Not only did he translate the Bible into German, but he had prefaces to the books of the Bible. So he's basically saying, here's the book of the Bible. Now, before you read this epistle to the Romans, let me tell you what you should look for in here. And now he's going to spell out justification <laughs> by faith alone. Uh, this is what you should be looking for. Uh, so it's not just a translation of the Bible. It's basically giving you a commentary, a way to interpret the Bible with his particular theological interpretation spin on it. Uh, uh, so, there, it's, so that's very important. If you read the Luther Bible, you got the Bible, but you also got Luther's interpretation of the Bible. Now, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. French king and oh. with like both the French king and the Pope being against him, like how did Charles use uh, Christianism as like a way to, to like destroy or like not want to tourism against him? Because like if they both weren't agreeing with him, how could he? And they were like the most. Well, they well, they they weren't opposed to him theologically. I mean, uh, the uh, they, they were opposed to him politically, uh, but you got this mixture of politics and religion. So they, uh, both of Francis I and the Pope did not want Charles V to centralize power. And they thought that if he suppresses Lutheranism and suppresses the Lutheran princes, he's going to be centralizing power. And they didn't want that. So, so it's, it's this complicated story uh, of the Pope supporting the, uh, kind of say, the, the, the friends of Luther. It's a very strange story. Um, we have time for about two more questions. So you discussed a lot of the princes that were in the Holy Roman Empire and how they had to take sides, or it seemed like they had to take sides. Were there any princes that um, either didn't take sides or felt that this entire squabble was ridiculous, or um, and if that was the case, did it matter that much? 
Um, okay, were there uh, neutral pr princes? Um, yes, there would have been neutral princes. Uh, Lutheranism, but you, you couldn't avoid the Reformation. If it weren't Luther, it would have been Zwingli. It would have been the Anabaptists. In other words, there was reform all over the place. Uh, it would have been pretty hard to be neutral. I mean, um, the, some of these Lutheran princes actually <coughs> sided with Luther, with uh, Charles V, uh, and, and trying to get some political gain out of it. Um, so it wasn't always uh, uh, purely um, uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, determining your affiliation. Now, what areas did not have... Uh, could you live in without, if you lived in some area, you would have been Catholic. Everybody was Catholic uh, until the Lutherans showed up. So being neutral really means being Catholic, the old faith. So uh, uh, the, the territories that remain Catholic, you can say, were neutral. Uh, I guess you would say they, they would be non-neutral if the, the Protestants were coming in and they were trying to keep the Protestantism out or suppressing it. But all that territory was basically Catholic. The only place that was not Catholic was over here in Bohemia, where we have the Hussites. They never uh, got back, well, the Hussites got split into different factions. They were the Utraquists, who were uh, believed in receiving communion under both kinds. And they were Catholic. They had Catholic missiles. They sent their priests to bishops to be ordained. They had valid sacraments. Uh, but they were kind of a strange Catholic. They had Saint Jan Hus uh, <laughs> and praise. <laughs> so, but they were Catholic. Um, but there were fringes of the Hussites. They had the Taborites and the Orphans and the, um, um, the Adamites. Uh, and you had the Bohemian Brethren. So you had some other sects over there that were Protestant. But they weren't Protestant. They were Hussites. This is before Luther shows up on the scene. But uh, except for the Hussites, all the rest of it's Catholic. So being neutral means being Catholic. Yes. Yes, sir. Is there um, a split between uh, uh, urban areas and uh, more developed areas and uh, the rural areas? So are there, what the mean is, are rural areas more Catholics or more Protestants? <coughs> More okay, good question. Um, traditionally, uh, rural areas are more conservative. Uh, and uh, when Luther spread his views, he uh, basically, his preachers went to cities. Uh, if you look at how Protestantism spread, it spread either from the, the ruler and imposed down, or it spread by him sending out uh, preachers. And where the preachers went uh, was where the people were and they went to the cities. I, one thing I did not point out on the map is we talked about 319 different entities. Among these 319 entities were 81 of a special category called imperial free cities. These were cities that had a charter from the emperor. They ruled their own affairs. They did not have an overlord over them. They were directly dependent on the emperor. They were free, 81 of them. Of these 81 free cities, 60 of them became Protestant. So you say, why did these cities become Protestant? Uh, interesting. You can, there's a, there's, we used, you know, today we do confessionalization. You know, about uh, uh, 30 years ago, uh, the big, fan, uh, big uh, industry was uh, relig uh, the spread of Protestantism in the imperial free cities. You know, German scholars were taking this city, that city, that city, studying it all. What pattern emerged out of that? What normally happened is the preacher would come into town, a Lutheran preacher, and would start preaching to people, and they would listen to him. And <coughs> frequently it started among the lower classes, and uh, they would uh, go listen to this preacher and go to uh, try to get their local uh, parish to have this guy preach. Sometimes they went to the educated city council people, uh, and they thought that these were the reformers or educated in theology. They, it varied from city to city. In Nuremberg, it starts at the top with the patriciate, with the educated people, and comes on down. In other cities, it starts with these guys, with the common people, uh, and then it starts. And what happens in the cities is there's this mentality that we have to, you, 
act together. We cannot be divided in this city. It's very dangerous because we have lords outside who are trying to go take power away from us. We have to act together. So what happens in the city is when various uh, entities start becoming Lutheran, they sometimes have debates and try to say, well, how are we going to, what's the city going to do all together? We have to march together. So what frequently happens is they march together Lutheran. Uh, the idea that we can have different denominations in our city, that wasn't what they normally thought of. We have to be united. We have to go together one way or the other. Uh, so the rural areas, they don't normally send preachers out to the rural areas. They basically remain Catholic. Even when these territories became technically Lutheran, uh, there was a famous book by uh, Gerald Strauss uh, called Luther's House of Learning. And what he did is he got these visitation reports. The, 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 the prince wanted to find out, are the people down there becoming Lutherans? And he sent out investigators to go to various churches to find out, have you read Luther's catechism? Do you know what it means to be justified by faith alone? Do you understand that? Are you still praying to the saints? You know, are you, you, were you receiving sacraments? You know, so these investigators went out and checked up on things. And what they found out is that like 30, 40 years, 50 years after the territory went Lutheran, the people out in the Rory, the boonies, are still <clears throat> acting like Catholics. Uh, and uh, they decided, well, we've got to do something about this. We've got to have some, some serious CCD classes in Lutheran <laughs> theology. Uh, so they, uh, they, they, was, they, they were shocked at uh, how, how the, the peasants, the people out in the, would still remain basically Catholic. And we had to bring in good pastors, Lutheran pastors, to preach solid Lutheran doctrine. And we have catechism classes. We've got to teach you guys what it means to be a Lutheran. So it took a long time to get Lutheranism out in the rural areas. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, considering the proximity uh, with Muslims, with Turks, can we... Uh, Imagine any influence by Islam on, uh, on Martin Luther? On Martin Luther? Yeah, Martin Luther had a strange uh, uh, idea about uh, the Muslims. Uh, he, he, uh, he saw them as God's punishment. He thought, should we actually go out with an army to oppose them? Is they're attacking Vienna or attacking Budapest? Or should we say, we're such sinners and God is sending this army to punish us should we not just say, thank you, you, this is what you want to do, God? Okay, let the Turks come and take us over. That was one attitude of, of Martin Luther. He said, this is God's punishment. Uh, but no, he did eventually back the Lutheran princes as defending the empire. Uh, but did he, you know, he's talking about theology-wise? Theology-wise, yes. Theology-wise, I doubt if Luther ever read the Koran. Um, uh, I doubt it highly. Um, you know, uh, at this time, it, it, people kind of saw Islam as a Christian heresy. Uh, that uh, the, uh, if you read the Koran, I mean, there's Jesus Christ in the Koran. There's Mary. Uh, it, you know, these, 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 these um, Muslims, uh, are they really Christians who got some wrong notions? Uh, we, we could just, you know, correct their notions. We could bring them back. So I think they saw the Muslims as Christian heretics. That, that, that needed to be educated and bring them back. I invite you uh, 